Dr. Evelyn Sanchez. She graduated in biology by the Methodist University of Sao Paulo. She got a PhD in geosciences by the University of Sao Paulo. She's a professor of geosciences and paleontology at the Federal University of Valle do Jequitinhonha and Mucuri. Her research focuses on the paleobiology of the Precambrian, and she's also secretary of the International Subcommission of Stratigraphy of the Precambrian and Secretary for Outreach of the Brazilian Astrobiological Society. Remember, you are free to interrupt and ask questions in Portuguese if need be, so please don't be shy. Evelyn, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Well, uh, before I start, I want to say that it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I hope we have uh, the next hour be a nice talk about fossils, okay? Please feel free to interrupt me and make questions. I'll be happy to answer, all right? So here's the title of my, um, my lecture, Building a Bridge Between Paleontology and Astrobiology. As you can see, it's a huge <laughs> title. And it's a long lecture as well. <laughs> so I will uh, break it into, first I will talk about paleontology very fast because I know that not, not all of you um, has a, uh, gra are graduating in biology, so I will talk very fast, very, uh, rep uh, very in an express way about paleontology. Then we move on to astrobiology, and then we will combine both areas, okay? So, start here, by paleontology. Well, paleontology, uh, the, the word comes from the Greek, that um, put together three words, palaios, which means ancient, ontos, that means being, and logos, that means study. So, it's easy to understand what paleontology is. Paleontologists, they study ancient beings, so past life. All right? Easy. And how, how do we recognize this past life? Through fossils. So the object of the paleontolo paleontological studies are fossils. All right? So fossils are the signs of past life, which, is, which are preserved in a rock. Is it here? No? Fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, sorry. Uh, they are preserved somewhere. We can reach them. Okay. So, mm, let me ask, uh, who wants to be the volunteer here? Just a question. No one? Charlie. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, Charlie. Um, is your grandma still alive? There are two grandmothers. Yeah. Both are not. Both are not. Okay. So, do you agree with me that they represent past life on Earth? Ancient life. Hmm, please. Yeah, maybe. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay, <laughs> move on. So, uh, okay, so fossils are representative of past life, mm -hmm. ancient life, maybe like your grandma's, all right? Following the, the, how's your thing? Following the, yeah, the joke. Um, so, is, uh, are the remains of your grandma's accessible in any way? Are they are protected somewhere, right? Oh, that's new for me. <laughs> okay. So it's somewhere. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yeah, it was a bad choice. Can someone help me? <laughs> okay, imagine my grandma. Okay, she passed it away. Passed me. You can use it. Okay, so <laughs> are your grandma. Okay, thank you. Are your grandmas uh, uh, alive? Both. All right. Uh, so do they represent past life or ancient life? Thank you, Gustavo. <laughs> and uh, are they... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you need to enter into the <laughs> joke, you know? <laughs> and are the, uh, are the, um, the remains of them uh, accessible in somehow? Yeah, yeah they're protected, but okay. So, are your grandmas 
fósseis? It's past life. It's... Mm. Ok. Who agrees with... My mother's mother died when I was 19 years old, back in 84. So it's been a while, but I don't think she has fossilized. I checked because she's buried in the sanctuary of the family, and we check them from time to time. My mother is there, my grandfather is there, I will be there too. So, no, she's not a fossil, not just yet. Not just yet. Not just yet. Okay, it is yet, it's important. Who, who agrees with Gustavo? Mm. And who don't agree with Gustavo? No? Only me? Okay. <laughs> okay, the, this yet, it's important. Why? Because fossils, to be a fossil, it, the remains must be at least 10,000 years old to be a fossil. Uh, remains younger than 10,000 10, years, sorry, they are considered subfossils. So grandmas, Gustavo's grandmas, they are subfossils in somehow, as yours is somewhere in a university that are helping science, and mine, for example. Okay, easy here. Okay, can I move on? Right. Okay. Of course, dinosaurs are the most um, remarkable of fossils or representative of past life. Here I brought for you my favorite dinosaur, Spectrovenator hangei. It was found near where I live, Minas Gerais. <coughs> it's a Cretaceous dinosaur. And we only know two tooth, teeth of Spectrovenator that are inserted in a vertebra of a herbivory dinosaur. That's a very nice fossil record. Uh, but of course, um, fossils go much m beyond, much more beyond than uh, dinosaurs, and we know signs of past life uh, coming from different biological groups. Okay, we'll talk about them later. Well, and why should we study fossils? How can they help us um, somehow? Well, the applications for fossils are we can know, we can uh, understand the evolution of the biosphere. We can understand the evolution of the Earth system. Here, people, please keep on your minds that we are not talking only about the piece of rock that goes around the sun, all right? Call it a planet Earth. We need to think about a system, the Earth system. Keep that on mind, okay? We need that in some in few minutes. Well, fossils are also important for dating rocks, for paleoecology, to understand paleoenvironments and paleoclimate, um, the position of sedimentary basins, uh, and of course here it's important, oh, and stratigraphical relation, these two are very important for the oil industry. Uh, we can also have some idea about paleogeography and plate tectonics, and of course Astrobiology, mm, we all like it. Uh, and for all those applications of fossils, oil industry is the only one where you can get rich. All the other ones you do because you love it, like it. For <laughs> I'm sorry, people. Well, so as you can see, uh, no, here's an example of how fossils were important for uh, plate tectonics. Here it's Alfred Wegener, a paleoclimatologist. He lived in the beginning of the, in the first half of the past century. Well, he was the one to propose the plate tectonics based on glacial sequences in the, uh, the, in the continent that was once, um, that there were once Gondwana. But he, uh, he used he, his theory was based not only in glacial sequences but also in fossils, including Mesosaurus tenuidens, which is found it's a, a big lizard, no more than one meter um, from this, uh, this his face to his tail. He's found here in Brazil and Uruguay, and then in Namibia, in South Africa, and dates back from Permian, something between. 219 million years. And also Glossopteris, Glossopteris 
uh, which begins to paleopteridosperma group, which is mm, near the fern, something like that. Uh, and glossopteris are found, look, at South America, Africa, India, Antarctica, Madagascar, and Australia, all the past Gondwana. Okay? So, uh, other fossils are important for uh, the plate tectonics as well. Here we have Mesosaurus, Glossopteris, Lystrosaurus, and Sinognathus, our grand, 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 grand parent, grand, grand dad, something like that. Because this group, Sinognathus, give rise to the mammals. Okay? So, here's just for you to see how fossils are very important. Um, well, going back to this slide, I want to highlight two aspects, two applications of fossils that will be important for us. Okay? First, the evolution of the biosphere, and then the evolution of the Earth system. People, keep in mind that um, we know that. Uh, Biological evolution occurs, and uh, all the biological groups are subject to evolution. Is that fine for everybody? Do everybody agree with me? Okay. Uh, we know how evolution occurs. We know the mechanism. We know, we know the process beyond the evolution of life. But also, we need to know not only the mechanism, but we also need to know the evidences of uh, evo biological evolution, all right? And which evidences do we know about evolution of life? Someone wants to help me? Which evidences do we have that we, we look at it, at it and we see, mm, that's an evidence of evolution? I agree. Superbacterias. Superbacteria. That's so specific, but <laughs> why? <laughs> why you say so? Oh, because of natural selection and uh, uh, not natural, but uh, okay, artificial selection. Okay. Mm. Okay. Uh, what else? Yeah, of of mm, you know that's uh, polemical, controversial. yeah, controversial. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we always learn that on uh, on high school, right? Anything else? Oh, because of the selection as well. Okay, natural selection. What else? But that's all controversial, right? <laughs> yes, it is. Oh, no, no, Charlie. No, you need to be free of your... <laughs> okay, what I want to tell you is that the only direct evidence of biological evolution are fossils. They are the only direct, no doubt, of evo biological evolution because we can see the transformation, we can see the, and, and we can trace back all the history of a group through fossils, okay? And together with the rock record, fossils are also direct evidence and they support the evolution of Earth. Here we have, uh, of course, it's artistic, uh, a early Earth here, when the atmosphere was dominated by, was carbon rich and CO2 rich and then became oxidated and nowadays and something in the future here looking like Star Wars. Well, so uh, fossils are important for both to understand biological evolution and to understand the earth system evolution, right? Okay, and also it's important for you to keep in mind that biological evolution is a Unidirectional, just one way, okay? It's a uh, one way event. When it occurs, it uh, cannot be undone, all right? That's important. Okay, that's important. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, what do we have up to now? We have fossils. We already know what paleontology is, we know what fossils are, we know they, they comprise records of past life. Uh, older than uh, 10,000 years. We know the applications, mainly for biological evolution and evolution of Earth system, and move on. We have, um, we can, 
classify fossils in according to the uh, type of preservation. For example, we have body fossils, which are direct remains of past life. Here we have a, a fossil turtle, here we have ammonite, micro fossils, and a plant fossil. And we also have trace fossils, which are also known like ichnofossils. And uh, that means that um, they uh, means that we don't have remains, but we have the preservation of a behavior. So we, here we have a track, here we have a coprolite. Do you know what the coprolite are, uh, is? No? How can I say in English? I forgot. Fossilized shit. Poop. Poop rocks, yeah. Thank you. Entenderam? Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, that's it. And here, very nice, I have, uh, I brought here for you the burrow, uh, top burrow, burrow, of a giant sloth. A giant sloth, preguiça gigante, giant sloth. Here is the burrow where it lived, okay? So here we don't have the direct remains. We have some evidences of past life, and then we and that represents a behavior, so we call trace fossils, call them trace fossils. Easy, right? Can I move on? We also have chemical fossils when we don't have remains, not even a behavior, but some molecules are preserved in the rock record. We can also have casts, that means the original material is lost for some reason and replaced by grains, okay? And we also have molds, all right? Okay, so we have all this information up to now. Any doubt? Okay, and another appli important applica application of fossils is dating rocks. So um, here I have this nice picture, very colorful. My students love it. I see every semester I see this picture in the reports, but I hate it because it's, it's not fair. And I show you in a few minutes why I hate it. Um, but uh, here we ca you can see um, all the geological time, which means the extensive interval of time occupied by the geological history of Earth. In other words, the lifetime of Earth, okay? So we hear things here from the Archean, and we go up mm, to the Holocene, where we are today. We are in the Holocene, all right? And we can organize the time using either fossils. So we do, when we use fossils for dating rocks, we do relative age dating. Or we can do absolute age dating when we use isotopes. Isotopes, sorry. So um, when we use fossils, we do relative age because we need to compare. All right, oh, this strata is younger than that one. We cannot uh, infer a absolute number based on fossils. We can only say, oh, okay, this. This level, it's older than that one, that it's older than that one, okay? And guess who we apply here to organizing the time? The time uh, of the age of Earth. Someone? No? Huh? Which principle, which I have shown it for you already? The biological evolution. Okay, so evolution help us to understand what happened through time, and it doesn't come back, okay? It's a one-way way, one way, one way <laughs> drive. So uh, we base our relative dating on fossils and evolutive aspects that they uh, record. Okay, so another application here for, for us. Okay, that's what I have to tell you about paleontology. Easy, fast, because, okay, time is short. Move on to astrobiology. Okay, I brought here, I look at the Google. <laughs> I confess, I look at the Google. What, what is astrobiology, Google? Tell me. 
and he responded <laughs> to uh, 81,000 results. It's too much, I'm sorry. So I brought some of them. One from NASA Roadmap, the last edition, it's 2015. I think will be a new one in a uh, in in few uh, years. Well, which says that astrobiology address questions about past, future, extend, and interconnection of live things in the universe. I also brought uh, this Bloom, Bloom, Bloomberg because it's seated in so many works. So I brought here also for you the astrobiology is the study of how life interacts with planets, moons, and other objects in our universe. And here I brought for a, a publication Portuguese. That's a, a book about astrobiology. Uh, it's in Portuguese and says that astrobiology in the current view is defined as the field of research dedicated to understand the origin, evolution, distribution, and future of life on Earth and beyond. So here we can see some common aspects, right? So um, they talk about time, interco uh, interconnection, here we have evolution, also time, uh, interconnection somehow, right? Planets, moons, and universe. So we can say that astrobiology is to understand life in the context of the universe, right? Not only in our planet, but beyond it, right? And looking for uh, life in somewhere else in the solar system is just a branch of astrobiology. And of course, it's a multidisciplinary science. So we have here astrobiology connecting life in a cosmical context and with time. Easy? Okay, so of course we insert Earth here because we know, I will show you how uh, the cosmical, the, cosm the cosmo interacts with life on Earth. But of course, we can uh, insert here planets, moons, or even comets, as Ivan Koten showed us right before the, the lunch. Uh, well, one of the ways we know how life and universe interacts uh, are looking for, uh, is looking for the mass extinctions. They are a very good example how life interacts, or not, uh, not interacts, but is influenced by, uh, by the cosmos. Um, some of the mass extinctions, uh, it's, uh, it was caused by external extrinsic process uh, or events uh, like m asteroid impact or meteorite. Here, of the, the most famous is the Cretaceous, the Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction. It was caused by the impact of an asteroid. Also, the Devonian mass extinctions, uh, we are not sure, but meteorites is among the, one of the causes of these mass extinctions. And here in Triassic, uh, the mass extinction was not caused by the uh, uh, meteorite impact, but during uh, thir 13 million years before the mass extinction, an impact occurred and may cause a small mass extinction, okay? Uh, so that's an uh, interesting um, way how life is uh, influenced by the cosmos. And here I brought for you to, so how can we see this record? Uh, okay. Here we are, right, and you. I will show you Chicxulub. We go to Mexico, to the coast of Mexico. Oh, <laughs> I place a Chicxulub here, but actually it's here. So can you see this, this shape here, this geomorphology? Here it's pro here is the w where the, the asteroid impacted Earth. All right, we, we have a very nice record of this impact. Brescias and all the rocks melted here. It's easy to see, very nice. And the Chicxulub loop was the responsible for the extinction of dinosaurs, pterosaurs, mosasaurs, and all the, the big guys in the Cretaceous, all right? Um, here we have the record of the Woodleaf crater. 
it's in Australia. Actually, I couldn't find which one is the criteria. So I put here. <laughs> okay, I will show a picture of the criteria. And Woodleaf criteria is um, pointed as the responsible by the Devonian uh, extinction. We also have the Hancock Summit in Nevada, where we don't have the criteria, but we have brushes indicative of a meteorite or, or an impact. Okay, I'll show you. Uh, I'll show you the pictures. And we also have the Siljan Rink in central Sweden. These three um, structures are pointed as the responsible by the Devonian mass extinction. We are not sure which one caused the extinction because dating this rock is a problem, okay? So they are the, the, the possible cause. And here we have the Manio, Manicogan Reservoir, which I is in the west, in the east, uh, Canada, here we can see the lake formed in a crater, and here it's where the Triassic asteroid or meteorite impacted and caused a short mass extinction, not uh, a wild one. Okay, moving back to the presentation. So here is the record at the Hancock Summit. We don't have the criteria, but we can see the rock totally broken, all right, pieces here. Oh, here is where they occur. Here we have the Woodleaf criteria in Australia. So both are uh, pointed the candidates to be the responsible for the Devonian mass extinction. Well, another... Um, way that we see the life uh, interact with cosmos is through the orbital cycles, also known as Milankovitch cycles. There are uh, three cycles, uh, the uh, uh, changes in eccentricity, the actual precession, all right, the oh, okay, yeah. uh, and the um, changes in the obliquity. Of course, each one has a uh, different uh, time length, but sometimes it converges, they occur at the same times. And the rock record and the fossil record show us that when then combined, we have profound climate changes. The last time they uh, converge occur at the same way, at the same moment, we have the late Neoproterozoic glacial episodes, which is, um, which uh, is uh, now as the Snowball Earth Paleoclimate Model, where we have record of glacial, um, uh, glacial rocks in the equator. So imagine the ice coming to the equator. Imagine the temperature of the planet. Imagine here on the poles how, was <laughs> how cold Earth was. And those episodes occurred here. 714, 635, 580 million years ago, it was three episodes. And of course, imagine how life responded to those episodes. It was really complicated, mainly for those that um, used to do photosynthesis, okay? Because all the planet was uh, below uh, ice, below ice, even in the ocean, even in the equ equator area. Okay, people, so we know we have some examples from the geological record here on Earth that um, shows Earth and the cosmos interact, interact or influencing, the cosmos influence Earth, okay? And we know that through fossils, but imagine if we can do the opposite way, using fossils to understand, well, cosmical or mm, yeah, the cosmical relationship between life and other planets, for example. Comets are, um, uh, are 
polemical, okay? I will leave it for Ivan Corten. I hope he talks about this in the next days. <laughs> but uh, imagine applying fossils to understand uh, this interaction in other planets or moons. And here enters our bridge, make the bridge between paleontology and astrobiology. Here I brought a picture of Oscar Niemeyer's bridge at Brasilia. It's over the Paranoa Lake. I don't know if you have been there. It's an amazing bridge because it shows it's, you know, when we throw uh, a stone in the water that it kicks, <laughs> it rebounds, that's, um, that's the, what Niemeyer wanted to do. Well, so let's build a bridge between these two areas. Of course, we can uh, imagine we have a planet full of rocks, full of fossils. Where should we begin? too much, right. too much rocks, rocks everywhere, fossils everywhere. <gasps> Where do we begin? Mm, complicated. Maybe we can look <laughs> at the roadmap provided by NASA, which is, uh, of course, <laughs> an important document. And it brings seven topics that will uh, define, will lead the, the astrobiological research. It, is, uh, have, uh, it has been doing this in the past years, and is continuing to leading the, the research in astrobiology. So uh, it has uh, seven topics, and also an eighth topic is in the appendices. And um, here I highlighted four topics for you where paleontology can contribute. So paleontology can be useful to understand early life and decrease of complexity. We see that occurring in the fossil record. Also, paleontology can be useful to understand coevolution of life in the physical environment, of course. Identify, explore, and characterizing environments for habitability and biosignatures. Mm -hmm, nice. And construct habitable worlds. Of course, here this is more technological uh, topic than paleontological, but of course, we can help here to understand habitability, right? Because through time, the planet became habitable or was transformed in an habitable world. So uh, we can use fossils to understand uh, habitability. Sorry, you have that? You raised your hands? No? OK. Um, all right, people. Um, most of these events can be tra traced back in the history of life. All right, and I brought here uh, this nice um, graph from Noah and Bambash that shows us the mega trajectory of life, the main steps that life had went through since the beginning of the life until today, the appearance of intelligence. So here we have, of course, the appearance of life, the prokaryote diversification, unicellular eukaryote diversification, aquatic multicellularity, invasion of the land, and intelligence. All right? Do you agree with me that most of these steps that are recorded in the fossil record uh, can be applied here? OK. If we understand all these steps, this traje trajectory of life, we can apply here. So when we take a look when this happened, what we see is that beginning of life, appearance of life, prokaryotic diversification, eukaryotic divers diversification, and aquatic multicellularity occurring during a time interval that we call Precambrian. So let's take a look what Precambrian is, and then we are going to see this fossil record here. So Precambrian, it's here at the base of the, the geological time scale. Um, it's also known as Cryptozoic, Azoic, or Prefanerozoic rocks. Uh, it's not an official term, it's only um, unusual name, but it's well accepted. So you can write a paper using Precambrian term and nobody will ask you to change it because it's wild accepted. Um, Precambrian received this name because they correspond to rocks that came before K. 
Cambria. That's right, Fred Cambria, all right? And uh, what happened here to, uh, why those rocks are called Precambrian? This record here is called Precambrian. Because by the, that time when Darwin was alive, uh, was alive or uh, James Hutton, the, the mentor of the ge modern geology, uh, during the uh, 8th century, 18th century, 19th century, um, nat uh, um, naturalists, could track the fossils up to Cambria. Above it, they couldn't uh, understand what happened that there was no life here, no fossils, nothing. The fossil record stopped here and stopped with animals, with multicellular animals. So according to Darwin, for example, or for Hutton, uh, everything should occur gradually, all right? The gradualism was a, a widespread um, idea in that time. So we supposed to see life coming gradually appearing blah, 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 uh, until reach the Cambrian with nice fossils. But that not, that's not what happened. So for many years, Precambrian remained a total gap in our knowledge about rock, about earth. Uh, geologists know that much time was involved here, but they couldn't say how much time was inserted here, okay? Um, in, the how yeah, in the middle of the past century, Claire Patterson finally dated earth, and geologists started to date rocks. And finally, we could see that how uh, we could see how much time is in is inserted here. All right, we saw that uh, uh, Earth it's 4.55 billion years, and it was an amazing discovery. Imagine Earth before this dating, before applying uh, absolute dating. No one knows the age of the Earth. And suddenly, it was five point, uh, they, of course, they know that a long time was involved here, but don't, not much, no, they don't, doesn't know, they didn't know how much time it was. So when finally we have this age, it was, um, uh, the Precambrian was called deep time, because it's so much time, billions of years. No one was expecting billions of years. Well, here we have the geological time scale. We can see Precambrian here. It appears here, but it's not official name. Remember that. Precambrian includes a Dian, the, a time known as a Dian, that Charlie told us uh, this morning, about it this morning, uh, Archean and Proterozoic eons. See? Here is the Precambrian. And all these three columns here is Phanerozoic eon. It's another eon called Phanerozoic. Here you have eon, the eons called Proterozoic Anarchy. We are here on the Holocene. If we put this in the proportions, in the real proportions, what we have is that Precambrian is much longer than Phanerozoic. Right, it's 88% of the life of Earth. Okay, and which fossils do we know from Precambrian rocks? Mm, they appeared after, uh, in the since the mid of the past century, we have recognized sample uh, fossils in this uh, in this time. Uh, we know microbial fossils called microbialites and Microbial in, microbially induced sedimentary structures, known as MISS. We know microfossils from Precambrian times, which can occur associated to microbialites. I will explain what they are. We also know free cells that boiled in the water, in the water column in the oceans. And we know prokaryotes and eukaryotes dating back from Precambrian. We also know metazoans. Yes, we know animals from Precambrian. They appear at the end of the Precambrian. We know strange forms related to metazoans, but uh, we are not sure how much related they are. 
uh, range of morphs and near to morphs out and insert sets. Yes, insert sets. That means we don't know what they are. We know they are macrofossils. And when I say macrofossils, it's not a dinosaur. It's just a few centimeters, OK? But during the Precambrian, microfossils were centimeters and was, <gasps> wow, so high tech. <laughs> and um, biomarkers, we already have some polemical biomarkers from Precambrian, which can be organic matter, molecules, or isotopes. How do the, this uh, fossil are distributed in the Precambrian? Here we have Aegean, Archean, and Proterozoic. Microbi microbiolites, the oldest forms are 3.7 billion years, MISS 3.4 billion years, microfoss 3.7. Microfosses, they don't have a continuous record, but the oldest one is 2.1. Then we have another record at 1 billion years. And here we have the appearance of metazoans, the animals, about 0.6 billion years. And biomarkers, the oldest ones are 2.9 billion years. Well, think about the, those topics from the roadmap of NASA. What do we expect to find somewhere else in the solar system? Well, you can. Uh, of course, all of them can be applied, right? But we are mainly looking for simple forms of life or not so complex life. The only complex life we are looking for is something like <laughs> intelligent life. I think that's an ego involved in that. But um, we are looking mainly for something mi microbial like something elsewhere. So, of course, from these type of fossils from Precambrian, metazoans, mm, we can by now risk it uh, from our list, and um, microbiolites, MISS, microfossils, and biomarks, they are targets to be um, prospected in other moons and planets. And I'll show you. Well, let's take a look in what we have in the fossil record. And then we go to the astrobiological application of them. So starting by microbiolites, oh, here you can have an idea of what they are. Light means rock, and microbial means microbes. So rocks made in by microbial forms of life. Uh, the, most common, uh, the most common forms of microbiolites are the stromatolites. Here I brought uh, a picture of them, and there in the entrance of the room, I brought some samples for you to see. Um, stromatolites, they are a sedimentary structure that are constructed by microbial mats. So here is a picture of a microbial mat, see? It's a consortium uh, and a group I mean, or, uh, of, <coughs> of cyanobacteria and bacteria that grows uh, looking for mainly for uh, light, of course, because the topmost layer is cyanobacteria, so of course it wants light. Okay, but as they grow here, falling physical chemical gradient, they face sedimentation. So the microbial mat needs to fight, needs to um, go ahead, even sedimentation occurring. What type of sedimentation? carbonate or siliciclastic, grainy uh, sedimentation. Everything occurs under the water. We can find stromatolites at the oceans or lakes or playa-like playa environments. And they go through lithification and diogenesis. All right? So as the microbial mat grows and sedimentation occurs, we have this feature here, the typical feature of a stromatolite, that is lamination, all right? Here we have two examples from Brazil, one from Bambui Group, and other from Caboclo Formation. It's 1.2 billion years here, 500 million years. All right, people. Uh, here is a picture of an astromatolite from Una Group. It's um, five, five, 500 million years, a little bit more. See the lamination? Uh, 
Look at the top of the sample. Mm. See here, this black thing here? Oh, here it's a zoom. <gasps> Do you know what it is? That's the microbial mat, the fossilized microbial mat in the stromatolites. Very nice. No one cares? No? No? I just feel like. Sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And we can see here. See the same color, it's here among the lamination, okay? It's a carbonatic stromatolite. All right, here, are the, here we can see pictures of the oldest stromatolites in the world, one of the oldest. They are from Wa Warawuna group in Australia, Paleoarchean. See here the lamination, very beautiful. Here is another form, it was a, a pleasure and honor to see them. I touched it and I felt the power of Paleoarchean when I, when I touched them. And here, as Charlie showed us this morning, we have this really old occurrence, 3.7, at Isua Supergroup in Greenland. Here we can see the lamination here. Of course, most of the lamination can be lost due with diagenesis, due in geological events here. We have one sample that where you cannot see the lamination, but it doesn't mean that it's not an stromatolite, all right? Uh, Microbial-induced sedimentary structures, or MISS, they are, um, they form when we have the microbial mat growing up in a surface, but it doesn't form an stromatolite, okay? We, here we see the bedding plane of a rock, okay, where the sediments were being deposited, and uh, the microbial mat grow in these sediments, among the sediments, and it mm -hmm. uh, gives rise to this type of structures here. Well, they represent the interaction between microorganisms and sediments. Uh, they record the life in silistic environments, or where, grain, where we have more grains than minerals precipitating. For example, in a sand beach, right? Uh, we already know 17 types of MISS, and the oldest one is 3.4 um, billion years, and we have a to recent. If you go to the beach, you can see uh, an uh, MISS there. Here we have some fossils of MISS recognizing the Brazilian fossil record. And here, <laughs> believe me, we have <laughs> the oldest ones. Uh, they were found in the Waimaruna group. Uh, can you see here this circle uh, circles here? Not circle, ellipticals, right? Here, here, here. And we can also see this, this erosive area. These are, this is where the microbial mat is, and here we have pieces of it distributed over the bedding plane. And here we have, see, these circles here? Each one is a piece of um, MISS, uh, of a microbial mat, I'm sorry, all right? So they are the oldest MISS that we already recognize in the fossil record. Well, here I brought for you the universe of microfossils. We know microfossils, thousands and thousands of species. Every domain of life can um, form a microfossil. Imagine how to classify them. It's a, a nightmare. Okay, so eukaryotes can be preserved as microfossils. Archaea can be um, preserved as microfossils as well as bacteria. So, imagine how difficult supposed to be how to classify them. So, um, someone have a good idea to classify them not as the biological affinity, but following the, the composition of the cell shell. So, we have four types of microfossils. We know calcareous microfossils, 
silica microfossils, phosphate microfossils, and organic microfossils. Much easier, right? Then try to <laughs> classify them here. Um, so, and during the Precambrian, we only have the carbonaceous uh, microfossils. Here I brought for you um, the one of the oldest microfossils. It was found in the Nouveau-Aquitouk greenstone belt in East Canada. Here we can see the filaments here, here, here. We have some circular uh, structures, and here, here. It was found in a banded iron formation, a rock, in an iron-rich rock, uh, and dates back 3.7 billion years. We also, mm, that's nice. That's very recent. It was uh, published in past March. And we also have fossils from the same locality, Nouveau-Aquitou Greenstone Belt, which dates <gasps> 4.2 billion years. That's a dia. That's very early in the history of life. So if if it, uh, in the history of life and, and Earth, imagine if Earth, it's 4.5, and we already have microfossils from 4.2. It rests only 300 million for Earth to form, different, differentiated, and starts all the system and, and, hold, and holds life. It's an uh, impressive record. Where are the stromatolites? Hmm. Good question. <laughs> they are here. See this? These filaments here, um, here the bo the circular structures. Uh, here we have some circular and filaments here. But if you cannot see, you can check it on this beautiful <laughs> scheme here. <laughs> Looks like a paintbrush. Do you remember paintbrush in the 90s? Yes, that's what Papineau did. Sanchez would uh, would publish something like that, no, would not, never be allowed, but Papineau can publish something like this. So, um, well, it's a very important discovery, of course, it's under discussion, it was a <gasps> ah, an, uh, an event in the paleontology. How controversial is that? I heard nothing about it. Everybody just received, I think people are processing the information. All right, um, that's what I heard, processing information. Uh, wha uh, I talked to some researchers from Precambrian rocks and they told me, oh, let's wait, someone will <laughs> reply that, let's wait. <laughs> uh, but uh, to, do the to those three people I talked to, no one agrees that those are microfossils and I don't think so, all right? Well, but they are published, okay, um, and let's move on. So what we have is here in the Adyan, we have this occurrence. We have the 3.7 occurrence in also in both in Canada. We have this nice occurrence in Australia of past cells, right? And between 3.4 uh, and 2.4, we have some gaps in the micro in the microfossil record, but after that, the record is continuous. We see through the time, through all the geological time, the fossil, uh, the record of micro microfossils. All right, and. All these times they are carbonaceous, okay? Here they are preserved in iron-rich rocks. They are preserved by iron, casts, all right, of iron. But they were originally carbonaceous. And the other three types of microfossils appear during the Phanerozoic. Yeah. Well, 4.2. 4. There are no banded iron formations older than that. Not that we know. Uh, I thought there were no rocks in the ADN, only minerals. 
so it's surprising to see mm -hmm. banded iron formation, which are rocks. Yeah, yeah, and not only rocks, but demands a special uh, environment to deposit to be deposited. But yes, that was a surprise. Uh, we also know some rocks already for the Adian, late Adian. Okay, in the subcommission, we are discussing to divide Adian into two moments. Uh, Paleo idea, something like that, the EU idea, and the difference between them is the record. We also we have rocky records, full of them. Uh, we have Acasta, the oldest part of Acasta, it's idea. We have something in India. We have something in South America. All right, and we are full of minerals everywhere. They are appearing everywhere. Oh, and we have the North China Craton, which has. Okay, so it's appearing. <coughs> yeah, Hervé just said that there was a difference between rocks and minerals. Could you explain that? Okay, <laughs> rock is a set of minerals, man, mi different minerals forming, or it can be formed by just one type of minerals, but will um, be also microscopic manifestation of the s only one mineral. If it's formed by one, one oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, okay, so a rock is um, a set of different minerals, right? And a mineral, it's a, it's a solid phase of uh, a substance, all right? Okay, all right. Uh, we here we have the gunflint biota, which is also interesting because we have nice cells here. We have no doubt that they are cells and different cells. Look, the architectures, we have round cells, tube cells, filamentos. We have eoastrium, which is look like a star, right? And we have uh, my favorite microfossil, cacabecchia, umbrellata. We have nothing similar to it nowadays. All right, uh, we don't know a bacteria or archaea that looks like cacabecchia. All right, and those microfossils are preserved also in banded iron formation here, BIF, B -F -I -B -I -F, um, which means iron rich rocks. It's um, found in one of the Great Lakes in North America, and they were, uh, they. Um, the environment where these cells live it was a subtitle setting, subtitle, very uh, deep. Um, we know 16 taxa, and six of the 16 taxa, taxa is of uncertain affinity, or in other words, we have no idea what they are. That's why it's so nice. Huh? Um, here we have this nice um, rip, uh, study done by Lara. Lara, she's Brazilian, she's now in France, together with Douglas, which was here past week, some of you met Douglas here, uh, and they analyzed these microfossils from gunflint biota in very high resolution. See here, we are in the mi micrometer scale here, it's the microfossil again. And using these techniques, these very powerful techniques available in France, they uh, analyzed the composition of the fossil and they uh, show it different phases here. They show it the different composition of the cell. So they demonstrate how these cells are preserved, which is very important to understand the geological events then lead to the preservation of these cells. And of course, if we know how a fossil is preserved, it's much easier to look in somewhere else, all right? It's a very nice uh, research. Okay, we, are, we have lots of microbial mats, 
preserved in the Precambrian rocks. Here we can see cyanobacteria. Here we see a the rest of microbial mats with some cells here, other cells here. Oh, here we have an algae. Very nice. Bangiomorpha pubesis were described by Butterfield in 2000. It dates back from Mesoproterozoic of Canada. And this algae already presents sexual dimorphism. It, it's not female and male. In algae, we say positive and negative. And that appears during the Precambrian. So, can you. Uh, understand what, what happened during the Precambrian, the appearance of life, the diversification of prokaryote life, the appearance of sexual di dimorphism, mm -hmm. microbial mat dom dominating the earth, and the appearance of eukaryotes. Say hello to your grand-grand-grand-grand-grandmother or grand-grand-grand-granddaddy, something like that, because here are the oldest eukaryotes. We called them acritarchs. They were just small cells, round cells floating in the ocean, but that's where we begin. <laughs> we also know some fungi for Precambrian rocks, but they are much recenter, recent. And we have uh, vase-shaped microfossils here, which means they were eukaryotes, but they have this protection in his, uh, they, they develop a shell. Uh, no, that's it, that's the only figure I have. So, why does someone need a shell, needs to, to mineralizing something? An idea? What happened? Protection. Yeah, protection, exactly. So that's the indirect evidence that the oldest indirect evidence of preda predation, predation, right? It's uh, the oldest mm, basic shaped microfossil is seven, 700 million years. And we also have this thing here that looks like a grain, a sand grain, but uh, Prave and colleagues, they totally defend that this is a porifera. This is a sponge date back of 706 million years. So people, that's what we have up to now uh, in the Precambrian Force record that may be of our interest for astrobiology. Um, Precambrian microfossils are here in that, uh, in that group, in those groups, okay? But how about the other ones? They didn't leave in any fossil record? Yes, probably they did. But the question is that only, hello? We We only have morphology, you only know shapes. So it's complicated to set a group for each fossil. All right, because we only have morphology, and morphology doesn't mean uh, relationship between groups. Okay, so it's kind of complicated to solve this problem. Well, we have another problem that, besides morphology, we also, uh, here is the tree of life, all right? We see the branches here. Do you agree with me that in this uh, direction we have time? All right, going, passing here. And not only time, but we have complexity. Okay, all right. Oh, actually complexity should be this way. Well, but we know that not always the life evolves this way. Maybe the correct way to represent the evolution of life is that way. It's a net, all right? or it's a mess, <laughs> okay? So, and here we have the primitive cells, uh, the origin of life, and here where we are today, the three domains of life, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. And here, in this direction, we have time. So, imagine with me, uh, 
here where we are today. If we come back in time, for example, in this moment, which kind of domains we would have here at the moment? Archaea, bacteria, eukarya, maybe not. Okay, we don't know who was there, uh, who was uh, supposed to be there. And imagine, so to classify a very old microfossil, to which uh, part does it belong? Ah, we don't know. It's so hard, okay? But yeah, we always try to set, uh, we say, uh, for example, Papineu, in that idea, microfossils, uh, they uh, described as bacteria-like, of course, so resembles bacteria, but it's not a bacteria, all right? And we need also to uh, keep on my, our minds that the domain of, the three domains of life is just a small part of the extent life, which is just a small piece of every, uh, the, the life that ever existed, okay? So there is all of these life forms in the fossil record, or probably in the fossil record, and how to classify them, how to identify them, <laughs> right? Okay, and we also have the problem of taphonomy, the preservation. Here we have the, um, okay, the organism dies, all right? And not, not everything that dies are buried, and not that everything is buried is preserved, okay? The biological process uh, decreases in this direction, and also the information, available information for to classify this dead body here. And uh, the physical process takes uh, the, the domain. So, see, so we have the, qu the problem of only have morphology, only the problem of the evolution of life as a net, not as uh, as a, a tree, and we have the problem of the how much life do we know, and the preservation of life. So it's four challenges to identify, to understand past, real past life. Going to biomarkers, uh, we know some organic matter and molecules in the fossil record, the pre-Cambrian fossil record, and some isotopic ratio like uh, carbon, uh, and uh, sulfur as well can un can help us to identify past life. Um, we have two occurrences of biomarkers in the Precambrian. Here we have the this guy here, uh, which can um, which corresponds to porifera algae and protists. And that one, that uh, Gino Sterano, which corresponds to dinoflagellates. Uh, that here you can see the the question marks. That means the this um, biomolecule should not be here. They probably are contaminants. All right. So mm, very old uh, biomarkers are polemical. And the oldest occurrence of biomarks are from Neoproterozoic, very late in the Proterozoic, in the Precambrian. It was identified here in Brazil, okay, by Ocot and colleagues. Uh, they identified very nice carbon chains indicative of photosynthesis during the glacial episodes I already showed to you. Already showed to you. So going back to this, a uh, nice document. So Precambrian life can help us to identify early life and the increase of the complexity. We know how that happens. We have some some uh, some clues of how, how that happened on Earth. So we can apply elsewhere. We can trace how life and the physical environment evolved. Uh, we can identify these biosignatures, okay, we have some challenges as I show you, but uh, okay, we can deal with them, and how Earth became habitable. Uh, of course, the mainly target for past life out of Earth is Mars, okay, and 
to look for past life there. Some questions arise like when would life become established on Mars and where that happens and where would life expand it to colonize it. We know that on Earth life began at the in the oceans and then went to land. But okay, but is this true for Mars as well? Uh, and where would life persisted? Mm. So is it, there is is there is still life in on Mars? Well, and there are five lines of research for search of past life on Mars: microfossils, biomarks, biominerals, bioweathering, and sedimentary structures like stromatolites. Um, we, we, we can say that because uh, the evolution of Mars, Mars for a short time was very similar to Earth here at the beginning of the, uh, its life. And here, when they were similar, Earth already have, uh, already have life. So it's possible that Mars hold, uh, held life as well. And there are some research, some scientists that defend that life not only occurred in Mars, but are still there, maybe in fluid inclusions, maybe in veins, or even in pores and fractures somewhere on Mars. Um, and Mars, are interest, uh, Mars is interesting for past life because during the early life of Mars, uh, we have the formation of basins, and where is where f we found fossils in basins. Uh, we have complex systems of river, rivers and stuaries, so we, that means we have water, means we have an hydrosphere, an atmosphere, and that su supports life. Okay, of course everything was lost during the Asperian Amazonian times, but uh, for a long time Mars was very um, suitable for life as we know it, all right? Here is just a uh, reconstruction of the paleo environment on North Mars. And Mars not only have the paleo, the paleo environments suitable for life, but also they, uh, Mars have, uh, has, sorry, Mars has uh, the typical rocks where we found fossils. All right, so uh, Mars has, is full of uh, oxides. Uh, the carbonates on Mars is polemical because probably it's not uh, sedimentary, it's diagenetic, but okay. And we also have silica there, which can, as we can see here, be uh, stable and so last lots of billion of years and be um, suitable for preservation of life. And we already have some labs there, né? the rovers are there. Uh, we have the opportunity in exploring the Noachian uh, rocks. Okay, uh, uh, opportunities is out of, out of uh, work, it's not working anymore. Uh, they supposed to look back in the very early rocks of Mars. Uh, Spirit explored the Asperian uh, rocks, but it's not working anymore. But we have Curiosity still working for surprise. It's surprising that its work supposed to stop a uh, few years ago, but it's still working. It's exploring the Gale crater and it's exploring the rocks of the late Neoarchean, which is a transitional moment between the dominated the domination of phyllosilicates to sulfate rocks. And we have the Perseverance recently, um, it recently got, get there, got there, and it's exploring the uh, Noarchean rocks. And also, well, it's not the main object, uh, the main goal, but we have the Chinese rover, Zhu, Zhu or Rong, something like that, which, are, uh, which is exploring Asperian rocks. But uh, this uh, rover is not looking for signs of past life. It's there just to understand the past environments and, and, uh, and the rocks of Mars. But of course, if it found something, of course, they will explore, right? Um, and we have some interesting, that oh, here is where the active labs are. So Perseverance here is here in the Jazeera crater. 
the Chinese uh, rovers here in the Utopia Planitia, Planitia, Planitia and um, Curiosity here in the Gayo Cartier. Gayo Cartier, hmm, here is a picture of the Gayo Cartier. And here are the outcrops that the Curiosity has um, uh, looked in more detail. The Yellowknife Bay is interesting because that's where Curiosit, mm, that's the Yellow Bay outcrop. Can you see here rocks? Different bedding planes of rocks. Okay, here we have the stratigraphy. Uh, we are not sure about how thick they are, but that's an estimative. All right. And mm, look what they saw there in the Gale Crater. Can you see this structure here? Looks like a pastel. It's look like a Chinese row up. <laughs> you know, like the pastel that we buy for Chinese food. Here and here, all right, and here. And that's a picture that someone showed us past week. Here you can see the bedding plan for rock. And those structures were recognized. What are them? They are MISS, the microbial induced sedimentary structures. Things like that here on Earth are interpret interpreted as microbial life sign, evidence of microbial life. And it was found, it was observed on Mars, there in the Gale Crater. Right? Of course, Nofke, the author of this study, she didn't want to say, okay, we found life on Mars. But she was very, uh, she wrote this paper, very, it's very interesting, and she proposed some strategies to understand this kind of uh, record. Uh, she says that the first steps to detect, of course, uh, accomplish, to identify, not only identify, but confirm and mainly different, different, differentiate from biogenic structures. That's the main step, all right? Um, so that's the, the conclusion of the article is about strategy that we should uh, accomplish, should perform to search such uh, such uh, a past life on Mars. Um, biomarkers are among the targets to not only sedimentary structures, but, but biomarkers. Uh, we have something also in Gale Crater found by Curiosity. In 2008, this article was published uh, reporting thiophene um, aromatic compounds and aliphatic compounds on Gale Crater. Uh, that uh, increases the concentration, the parts per billion, um, increases during the Martian the sun on Mars and decreases after it. Each year, that's a cycle that repeats each year. Very interesting. And recently, um, Perseverance rover uh, arrived in Jazido Crater. Here we can see a nice river, Paleo River, and a delta, and maybe a short line here, another river reaching the crater. Uh, so it was a, a lake, previous, previously a lake. Here we can see the topography in more detail. Um, and in places like this, we usually found stromatolites. So it's expected to found not only microbial life, but structures built by microbes, which are stromatolites, okay? Uh, and they are very common during the Precambrian times. So probably the bridge, bridge between paleontology and astrobiology is the Precambrian fossils. They may be the bridge, of course, along with technology, and uh, together they um, can do this connection between paleontology and astrobiology. 
Uh, but we need to take care about the biological affinity of such fossils. We need to remember the style of evolution of life. Uh, we need to infer to have better information about the paleoecological aspects of those fossils and the preservation is always a problem as well. So we have some challenges here, but we have a possible bridge between these two areas. So mission accomplished. And just to end my lecture, um, here on Earth, we understand modern life through physiological limits. Uh, we need to determine physiological limits and genetics as well. We, uh, to understand past life, we have to be sure about morphology. We need to understand paleoecological aspects, paleoenvironments, the biological evolution, preservation, and have some models. And here, we do usually go from process to product. So when we look at fossil, we not only have the products, but here we can infer the process, the format that product. On Mars, it's opposite. We are going to have products and then we have to infer process because they don't happen anymore. And then the search life, of course, is the same challenge, okay? We will need to deal with preservation, we need models, paleoecology, and mainly morphology. And just some recommendation, please. I really recommend, recommend Cosmos. Do you know Cosmos? Uh, the new one, not that one with Carl Sagan, the new one. Season one, episode seven, it's very nice. It's called The Cleaning Room, and they show all the challenges that Claire Patterson uh, faced to, determine, uh, to define the age of Earth. It's a very nice episode. Also, this article that explores how Precambrian life may be interesting for astrobiology here in Brazil. Of course, the roadmap by NASA, and that's the book that I uh, told you in Portuguese about astrobiology. It's available for free on the internet. All right? That's it. Thank you very much. Okay, we are running late with the uh, coffee break, but there is time for a few questions. Thank you. Um, you, you mentioned that um, the three glacial eras mm -hmm. with about uh, 100 million years between each of them, and the last one was recorded in uh, 50, uh, 508 uh, million years ago, but do, do you have uh, records of more recent uh, glacial years uh, yes. with we same interval? Yes, we have record of more recent uh, glaciations, but the recent ones were not so severe, so <coughs> hard, so complicated for life as those three ones. Those three in the late Proterozoic they were terrible. They were, uh, the original model proposes the collapse of life, something uh, the near, the life was near to collapse, okay, yeah, so. Why, why what? Do you, do you understand why it changed? Uh, why it, it, it didn't affect, the more recent uh, glaciations didn't affect life as the previous one? Bob, uh, probably because the conversion of the Milankovitch cycles along with the, some environmental causes as well. So we don't have the same uh, causings going together at the same time. So we have really to cut this short, unfortunately, but you may talk to Evelyn during the coffee break. Last question. Uh, what's the oldest uncontroversial evidence for life on Earth, the one that no one argues against, and how old is it? Where is it and how old is it? It's in Australia. <coughs> the record here of in a minute. Here. Those two they are not uncontroversial, and they are the oldest ones. 3.7. No, 3.4. 3.4. 3.7. That's the is one the everyone agrees with. Everyone agrees, okay. and it's very typical. And also, <coughs> that record, the MISS, here, uh, here, 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 <laughs> pieces of microbial mats. Uh, okay, so everybody agrees it's life. Okay, 
So let's thank Evelyn again and go for the coffee break. Hey, thank you.